So, um, yeah, let me introduce uh, Carmen Hermann, um, uh, our, our first speaker, not coming from Fermat. Um, so she is coming from the university in Hamburg. And yeah, he's one of the yeah, Fermat users, so to speak, right? So she, she's using the nomad aces for, for quite some time now. Uh, and I hope we are hearing something about that. So yeah, come please. Yeah, so thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. It's actually really, I think, very nice for me to be here and to learn a lot about the database we're using and its background. So I'm, I'm looking very much forward to the other talks and to the poster session as well. Um, the talk I'm going to give is mostly about science, about the science we do in the group. And um, as uh, Markus already said, we are using Nomad or Nomad Oasis to manage our data. And so I'll, at the end, I present a little bit what type of data we have and how we have used it so far, basically, and also a bit what the benefits are to us. So um, first of all, what are we doing? We are looking into molecular electronics and spintronics. We are doing simulations for these uh, topics. Why are we doing that? I mean, many of you will know that there was an original vision that oh, molecular electronics is going to replace standard electronics by making it smaller and smaller. So actually that vision hasn't really played out so far very much. And actually standard um, electronic devices are already reaching scales, length scales that are comparable with big molecules. So it's not so much, I would suggest, the main motivation to make everything just smaller and smaller um, rather, it's to use the special properties. So now this is a commercial example of an actual molecular junction that you can buy or could buy. Unfortunately, the company went out of business and I, each year I have to search for um, deeper and deeper in the web to find where you can actually still buy it. So that's apparently a shop from Denmark. So those of you who play the electric guitar may be happy about learning that there is a small device, an audio distorter that has the same sound as these... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lay woman in that uh, old style <laughs> vacuum tube or whatever based um, devices or audio distorters, but being much smaller. And the background is that if you look at molecular junctions and their current versus voltage characteristics, they are a bit smoother than if you use a pair of standard diodes. Well, that's roughly the explanation behind this. So this has been developed in the group of... Um, uh, McQuarrie and his co-workers, they founded the company, but apparently not so many people wanted to spend that's like four or 500 euros on <laughs> this audio distorter. So unfortunately, it went out of business. Um, another or the other application that is actually out there is uh, a CMOS compatible biosensing single molecule device. So they, apparently you really have single molecules bridging between nanoelectrodes and can do bi biosensing with them. It's CMOS compatible. So quite nice, also very recent, but that's about it. So it's not so far, it hasn't really revo revolutionized um, electronics, but nonetheless, it's very interesting to study these things from a, well, both, I mean, there may be other applications coming out of it, which some of them I will also show, and also fundamentally, I mean, if you think about electrons moving through structures, that's what's happening in biology all the time. So if you learn how electrons move through molecular bridges. That's very interesting in that sense. And it's also, I mean, it's something very fundamental, of course, or fundamentally interesting in the sense of maybe a spectroscopy where you look at mo how molecules behave under very unusual circumstances, non-equilibrium, strong non-equilibrium electrons moving through it, through them. And then this is something that we are very much interested in from a conceptual point of view, that if you think about how current flows through molecular bridges, that is conceptually related to how, in general, molecular bridges can help different entities talk to each other, so kind of electronic communication, which also plays a role, for example, in spin coupling. Okay, so just to give a rough overview of what's happening in the experiment, what are we actually trying to model? There are different types of experiments. So there are break junctions, which you see to the upper left, where people pull apart a small um, wire, a gold wire in the presence of molecules and hope for one molecule bridging or just a few molecules bridging. That's working surprisingly well, if you think about what this actually is. So it's been, it looks like what, the data suggests that this is really possible to have just one molecule bridging. Um, a bit more controlled maybe is 
STM data, low temperature STM um, measurements on how current flows through molecules. And a bit more maybe application oriented would be if you have, say, for example, nanoparticle arrays, gold nanoparticles covered by ligands, which then bridge when you bring the particles together, assemble them. And there you get kind of a statistical average of what each junction is doing. Um, the quantities that you measure are, well, current versus voltage curve. And this is also um, what we want to understand. Um, you see here that different molecules will have different conductances, which is not too surprising. What is maybe surprising at first sight is that the blue molecule up here, which is para-connected in the rings, as opposed to the meta-connection here, actually conducts much better than the red one with the meta-connection. It's a bit hard to see in this way how it's plotted, but here we're talking about microampere. Here we're talking about nanoampere. If you look at the scale, 0 0.2 versus 20 or so, then you realize we're talking about an order of magnitude by which this molecule conducts better than that molecule, the red one. And that's, I mean, from classic, from a classical point of view, they should conduct roughly the same, or maybe even the red one should conduct a little bit better because it has a shorter pathway. But if you think about quantum mechanics, then it, you you can you can understand that actually or and if you analyze this you can understand that the red molecule actually can show destructive quantum interference close to the fermi energy so if, if electrons comes in come in close to the fermi energy of gold they will destructively interfere and that's why the conductance is lower um so that's that's something you can see in the experiments actually it's a bit um yeah, so the, the, I mean, we're looking here at the at the dark data, basically, which is current versus voltage. The lower one here is the uh, derivative, the gray one, this one and that one. Uh, one thing that you also see in this data is that the um, data scatter a lot. So the data that are shown up here are measured at room temperature. And it's surprising enough, I think, that uh, you can actually see destructive quantum interference at room temperature. but I mean, that survives actually this, these fluctuations that are happening. Um, and here also you see that the data are just yeah, fluctuating quite a bit if you repeat the measurement at room temperature. And this is a general well, problem, uh, at both for applications, of course, but also for, for simulations. Now, this is a bit another look at this scattering. What um, is done by, by default, what's be, being done in the experiment is that you're not reporting the measurement value as is done in many other more controlled measurements such as most spectroscopies, but rather you report a broad distribution of data. And as you can see here in these conductance histograms and the X axis, you have conductance values and it's shown on a log scale. So we're talk talking about the distribution on about orders of magnitude. And um, yeah, all of, all of them are measured at some point, but you see that some of them are more frequently measured than others. So these four molecules here are all benzene rings with two substituents and the diamine, diethyl and so on refer to different substituents or anchoring groups and are bridged, bridging between gold electrodes. And what you see here is that at one quantum of conductance, you very frequently, this is very frequently measured. This is the conductance of one gold atom. So this is when you break a junction or a gold wire, then just before it breaks, one gold atom will bridge between the two ends of the wire, and that's what you measure here. And then the lower values are actually what's characteristic for the molecule or molecules you're um, measuring and this particular case or paper from 2006 it was shown that for if you use amine groups for anchoring groups then you get a decent peak here at around 0 0.01 quantums of conductance and that is interpreted as the most likely conductance value for this molecule and that is something that is reasonably reproducible when you repeat the measurement under similar conditions and with the same molecule there is each individual value that you measure is, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are several reasons for this. The junction fluctuates a lot and that changes the conductance. Then while you're measuring, you're pulling. So that also changes things. 
So each individual value doesn't mean too much, but the statistics and the most likely value is something that's reproducible if you're careful enough. I mean, I'm saying, I, I'm explaining that to make sure that we're clear about what we're talking about when it's about simulating these data, because it's not straightforward to say, hey, let's, let's just take a structure, press the button, and we get a value. Um, there's one thing that's saving us a bit, namely, um, if you compare these conductance histograms for different molecules, what's being done here is comparing a set of alkane molecules with amine linkers connected to gold electrodes or go by, uh, connected to a gold wire that's breaking. And for each different measurement or each different plot is for um, chains here with different numbers of carbon atoms. So you have um, two, three, four, and so on, up to eight carbon atoms or methyl groups in your chain. And accordingly, the most likely conductance value gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That makes sense, right? So longer wires don't conduct as well as shorter wires. Um, this again is shown here on log scale. And if you plot it this way that you say, okay, let's just plot the number of methylene units versus the most likely conductance value, you end up with a linearly decaying conductance. Since it's a log scale, that means you ex have an exponential decay of conductance with length. You can fit this and get out a decay parameter better. And the good news for theoreticians is that this decay is something that you can also model if you take one representative configuration, increase the number of carbon atoms, and then check how does the conductance decay. Then you will oftentimes see something similar. But I think it's important to keep in mind that what's behind that is a huge number of data from the experiment that is, has been statistically analyzed. And also it means that these trends, okay, that's something we can reproduce or hope to reproduce. Absolute values for just hitting this peak here is way more difficult. It's not necessarily impossible, but much more difficult. Um, one more thing that we need to take into account when we make wires longer and longer is that we need to be sure what is the physical mechanism of charge transport. What you see here is, the set of uh, structures that's again increasing by number of units. It's aromatic units in this case, so much better conducting than alkanes, but the principle is the same. What's also different is that what's plotted here is the logarithm of the resistance rather than the conductance, so the inverse. That's why it's increasing with length, but otherwise it's the same plot. And what you also see is that the slope of this increase changes at the point where you have three of these OPE units. And this is commonly interpreted such that in, for the smaller chains shown here, you have a single step tunneling through the junction, whereas for the longer ones, it's assumed that this is a multi-step hopping process that's thermally activated. This um, length dependence alone is not the only way how you can prove this or how you can make sure that's what's happening. You should also look into temperature dependence to be sure that the temp the, the um, thermally activated, more classical hopping is actually happening. And, but I mean, it's so far in most cases, it's, it's shown or it's turned out to be reasonably consistent or reasonable to assume, okay, the longer ones are hopping and the shorter chains up to three or four nanometers, the electron just tunnels through. So this means that if you're focusing on relatively short junctions, up to three, four nanometers, we can actually use a, an approach that's based on assuming that it's tunneling. And that basically gives us a current versus voltage curve that can be evaluated by looking at the transmission function, which is similar to a, con, uh, a tunneling probability as a function of the energy of the tunneling electron. So the x axis here is the energy and t is the transmission which um, will typically have larger values when you approach molecular energy levels. So then at that point, it means that the electron has a larger probability of making it through. And then as you increase the current, you will just um, go up with the, the, the integration range. And um, I just realized there's a part of my plot that has been cut off, but I mean, it's hopefully if you think about what, what comes out in terms of current when you integrate this function, 
as you go through the peak, then the current will increase a lot. And then once you're through the peak, it will start to flatten down again as a function of voltage, right? So it will be like a step-like thing. More voltage means, yeah. And this is basically what you see in the experiment here. For example, you have a relatively flat increase starting from zero voltage and then a step-like going up and then it flattens out again. So that's basically the theory. One important thing is also, if you're now looking at the conductance at um, zero voltage, you can estimate it from the transmission value at the Fermi energy multiplied by the, the quantum of conductance, which would be this value here in the middle. Okay, so this is basically what we do. Um, we do that by post-processing DFT calculations or other effective single particle stru electronic structure calculations. It could also be tight binding DFT, even Huckel will work. And we approach this by saying, okay, we have a gold cluster which models our electrode and molecule gold cluster. We partition the molecule into a central region, which is the molecule and sometimes also part of the electrodes are included, which is often also called the scattering region. And then we have left and right electrode regions. And we cut parts of these matrices out. I don't want to go into detail here, but we plug, we cut them out, put them together to get so-called self energies, which tell you what are the electrodes doing to the central part, basically. To make sure that we take into account the metallicity of the contacts, we play a trick and say our density of states of the contacts is constant, which is true for gold close to the Fermi level. So that works reasonably well. So this is why for a small gold cluster, we can still by this um, setting this to, to constant, we can still get metallic behavior in the end. It has been checked that this is consistent with if you do it in a more say, full way of actually evaluating the density of states from periodic boundary conditions. And then, by, based on the quantities that we extract from the um, Hamiltonian and from also from the overlap matrices, um, we get Green's functions and coupling matrices from which you can get the transmission. Again, I don't want to go into detail. I just want to make sure that if you cut your FOC or effective single particle Hamiltonian matrix into parts that come from the electrodes and from the molecule and coupling parts and post-process them the right way, you can end up with a transmission function. That's basically what we do. And there are a whole list of codes that can do this by now. There's ADF that has it um, implemented. Turbomol has a, um, not, it doesn't have it in the official version, but it exists. There's codes that are designed for electron transport, such as ATK, GPOS is also very good, um, which do everything, electronic structure calculation and the transport. There are post-processing codes such as one year 90. Um, we use a code that we have written ourselves that's called ATIOS that can post-process a range of electronic structure codes. It's also post-processing, so it does everything once the electronic structure calculation has been finished. How well does this work? Well, the comparison between the measured and the calculated conductance tells you that typically DFT or related approaches will overestimate the conductance by a factor that depends on yeah, the molecule, the experimental conditions and so on, which is not maybe too surprising since you saw how much the conductance fluctuates depending on um, or how, how big the range is. But what's important is that if you look at the sequence of structures that, that come from the same measurement, then the factor is relatively constant, which suggests that with, the, with this approach, we can learn something about trends. Um, one very nice example comes from the group of my colleague, uh, Jemma Solomon, Lartha Venkataraman, Colin Knuckles and others where they have looked into or designed a molecule that actually insulates better than vacuum, which um, may sound weird, but this again is due to destructive quantum interference. So if you manage to set up, in this case, a silicon molecule such that destructive interference really prevents any electron going through, rather than tunneling through the vacuum, you end up with something where based on this transmission function, you can in the computer at least say that, hey, if this was, if there was no 
molecule in between, if there was an actual gap, you would get the blue transmission function. Whereas if you have a look at this molecule shown up here, which is this curve, the yellow curve, close to the Fermi energy, it goes down due to this destructive quantum interference. So it's less conductive than if there was nothing. And this is consistent with experimental conductance um, histograms. So that's one way of illustrating how helpful this, this approach can be. I mean, of course, this is experiment in theory, but there was a close collaboration between the two. And I'm not sure without, whether without these calculations, it would have been clear that yes, let's just synthesize this molecule and see whether it's conducting less than, um, than, uh, than vacuum. Okay, now a few examples in terms of what are the challenges for molecular electronics and spintronics. Spin is always a challenge for electronic structure methods. Um, why do we need spin? Well, spin can, for example, help in um, uh, the coupling between spin and electrons going through a junction can make um, or can, can help to spin polarized currents. And this has been shown to be helpful for creating hydrogen in electrocatalytic situations, such as the one shown here, both by making sure that electrons which come out at the end where oxygen is produced are already pre-aligned to produce triplet hydrogen, and also by preventing side reactions where hydrogen peroxide is um, formed, where you need paired electrons. The mechanism behind this, basically this phenomenon where one electron goes through, if it has been favorably aligned, whereas another electron with the spin in the opposite direction doesn't make it through, which is also called chiral induced spin selectivity, the mechanism is not really understood yet. So that's one big question in the field. Why is this happening? We have done simulations for this based on two component DFT. Others have done this too, like um, uh, Giovanni Cuniberti and uh, his collaborators. And what they found and what we found is that the spin polarization, that's basically what's shown in the red line here, is very, very small. In the experiment, we're talking about 60% or more often, up to maybe even 100%. So it's not clear why is it so small. Um, just to show what does this tunneling approach tell you, it tells you that if you invert the helicity of the molecule, then the spin polarization inverts, which is great. So we're here looking at the like a carbon chain, which gives you a bit more to see. So there's a higher polarization that we find. So we chose this because we actually see something rather than interpreting noise. Um, so the approach tells you that, okay, it's inverting. If you invert the helicity of the helix, which makes sense. It also tells you that as in the experiment, this is on DNA and peptides, the spin polarization of the electrons that tunnel through get longer and uh, get stronger and stronger as the chain gets longer. We also see that. So here to the right, we have 20 atoms. To the left, we have 40 atoms. Spin polarization increases. We also see that it's very much dependent on details of the functional. In that case, uh, the, the approximate exchange correlation functional. In this case, how much exact exchange you mix into it, which is good on the one hand because it tells you that maybe we can get here up to 5% spin polarization. So maybe DFT isn't too bad. But on the other hand, it also tells you you should be very careful. I mean, that's known that you have to be very careful with exact exchange in spin dependent properties. But yeah, um, there are several suggestions how to go on from the, here. So electron phonon coupling would be one important contributor, interface effects correlation and exchange, spin orbit coupling, how do you describe it? So our goal here is to go deeper into these mechanisms and hopefully find out together with our colleagues who are all have all made suggestions into this direction, hopefully find out the mechanism at some point and structure property relationships. Um, another very important issue, which is um, linked to well, it's one of many issues linked to the interface between molecules and metal surfaces. I just want to focus on one of them, which is correlation between the adsorbate spin and the metal, known as condo effect. Here, what you basically have is 
you have a, say, spin polarized atom on a metal surface. And then you have to decide, okay, which of the d orbitals of this adsorbate is actually contributing to this correlation, which then leads to a peak in conductance at zero bias. Um, this is important, for example, to decide, is there a spin pole in the conductance pathway? If there is, then you will maybe see this effect. If there's not, then you won't see it. So if you want to know how your spin polarized adsorbate or molecule is connected and whether the current is flowing through the spin side or not, it's important or interesting to see whether there is a condo effect. And again, this is tricky because here um, we, we found together with um, Giorgio San Giovanni and his group that if you improve the approximations made in typical kind of um, yeah, strong correlation electronic structure methods, you suddenly get a qualitatively different answer. Suddenly you get the answer that all 5D orbitals are important for the correlation, whereas with standard approaches, it's, it's only two. Um, just to say how this works, um, it's basically a DFT calculation, which is then again post-process by parametrizing a so-called under, under zone impurity model. And from that, you get the condo properties. Now, the third, um, aspect is something I'd already um, mentioned. It's not easy to model the, or it's important to model the statistical distribution of conductance data. We have done this based on machine learning because, I mean, if you have a MD trajectory to model the statistical contributions and you want to have conductance values for each of the MD snapshots, it's going to get pretty expensive. But with machine learning, we found that you can use 10% of the data that you have evaluated with, say, DFTB or something, or DFT, use them to train a model, in our case, based on Gaussian process regression, and then get the conductance histogram. It's barely visible, the difference, the, which is more or less identical to the one you would get from the full DFT or DFTB calculation. Um, so, that's something we want to build on. I'll skip this to um, briefly mention that um, NOMAD and NOMAD OASIS, which we're using, has really lots of beneficial properties, which um, such as it's designed for machine learning applications, which we do. It's uh, um, easy to share data. The source code is accessible. And you can easily also, or not easily, but you can write your own parsers and scripts, which is, I think, really, really helpful. Version control. Here are three aspects where we think we would hopefully be able to contribute at some point to, or maybe I'm, maybe this also already exists. I don't know. Such as, um, can we check whether um, molecular structures that we generate with whatever way of generating just automatically putting structures together. Do they comply with basic chemical rules? That would be nice. Is there a way to check for duplicate entries, both maybe from us, but also maybe compared to other groups who have already uploaded things? Can we match identical molecular structures which have been put in with different, say, um, electronic structure methods or maybe different spin states, charge states? So, which would be beneficial for um, if you have inhomogeneous data sets or multi-fidelity learning and so on. So these are things where maybe, hopefully, either we can contribute or we can, others will, uh, or maybe there are already solutions. So um, in, yeah, in that sense, we have profited a lot from Nomad. Um, we have used it to upload data, for example, for the chiral induced spin selectivity to make it available in terms of publication. We have also used it to, um, in, in the sense of using Nomad Oasis, we have used it for storing data in our own group, and it has, also, has already been very valuable. Now, um, a bachelor student just started, and he was supposed to work on the condo effect. The postdoc has left more than a year ago, but I could tell him, hey, he has deposited his structures in our Nomad Oasis. Just go search for it. So he put in the name of the postdoc, found the structures, used them, and it was easy. So it was really helpful for us. So thanks a lot for um, making this possible. So uh, Claudia and Matthias have helped us a lot to get our, by, by supporting a DFG proposal, which is using Nomad. And in the context of machine learning, uh, Markus has been very helpful in getting it set up locally, my group and collaborators. And yeah, thank you all. Oh, thank you very much.